Scoliosis is a common spine condition often found in adolescents. Roughly 3 million new cases are diagnosed in the United States each year. While scoliosis can develop during infancy or early childhood, the primary age of onset is between the ages of 10 to 15 and occurs equally among both genders. For a small number of them, the spinal curve worsens as they grow, resulting in the need for a brace or even an operation. We will discuss identifying and treating scoliosis on today's episode of CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jane Hansen. Joining me is Dr. Salvatore Zavarella, an attending neurosurgeon from Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center, St. Catherine of Siena Medical Center, and St. Joseph Hospital. Welcome. It's good to have you here. Hi. Thank you. Happy to be here. So let's <coughs> set the stage. What exactly is scoliosis? So scoliosis is a spinal disorder that's diagnosed with various uh, modalities. Uh, it's basically abnormal curvature of the spine. It can occur typically in the thoracic or lumbar spine, which is kind of the middle of the spine, the mm -hmm. low spine. It can also occur rarely in the neck, but it's truly defined as an abnormal curvature of the spine that can result in different symptoms. Well, so when you talk about these symptoms, symptoms mm -hmm. that could be making life difficult or meaning you can't walk properly or meaning you just got a little curve? So it, you know, it's a good question. Patients start out with typically minimal symptoms and then if we find that the curve is progressing, they can develop symptoms of back pain. They can develop symptoms of respiratory difficulty or breathing oh, difficulties. Because it's what? It's getting into their lungs? So the curve can become so significant that it can actually collapse a portion of the lung and, and cause difficulties with patients to breathe. They can have difficulties with ambulation or walking because their legs could actually be a different length. Their pelvis could be off. They could have muscle spasms. They could have muscle strains. And these are some of the, some of the symptoms in the adolescent populations. And then as we age, you can also develop scoliosis and you can have symptoms of lower extremity or leg pain that's like a shock-like sciatic type pain. Mm -hmm. You can have symptoms of feeling like you're leaning forward and that could cause low back pain. You could have symptoms of um, uh, bowel and bladder incontinence if the, if the compression of the spine becomes too great from the curves. Wow, so I guess the skeleton, I mean if you think about it logically, the skeleton can really affect everything by the way it just repositions itself then. Right, right. So the nerves leave your spinal cord and go out and serve to innervate or give signals to the organs mm -hmm. and to the muscles. And so if those nerves, for whatever reason, become pinched, you can have symptoms that are, are pain, to weakness, to numbness, mm -hmm. and it could also lead to problems just with your ability to breathe, as I said. So a lot of women, when they get older, tend to start to have a, a curvature to the back. Correct. Which can usually mean that perhaps they have osteoporosis or something like that. Is that somewhat the same thing? So this is, it's a form of scoliosis. It's called kyphoscoliosis, and it occurs from basically the spine degenerating over time. The discs can degenerate. The bones can degenerate, can degenerate from osteoporosis, and that can lead to collapse of the discs and the sense of that you're leaning forward or listing forward. Mm -hmm. And when that occurs, you can develop back pain, leg pain, uh, and these at, at times need to be treated. Okay, so uh, th th there's so many different symptoms. Mm -hmm. Is there, when is surgery required? Well, so when we talk about the adolescent or the, or the younger population and we talk about the older population, these are two different populations of patients that ultimately need to be treated. Mm -hmm. If we talk about the adolescents first, this is typically diagnosed during school when you're 8 to 12 years of age. We do bending tests typically in school and they look to see if there's any abnormal curves of the rib. 
If there is any abnormal curvature of the rib when you bend forward, then that will lead to further testing to include an x-ray and then a consultation with a specialist. Ultimately, what happens is these patients will be put through a conservative course of therapy depending on the curve, mm -hmm. depending on how significant it is. If patients go through these conservative treatments like exercise therapy, physical therapy, rehabilitation, and we find over time that their curve is not progressing, then typically we don't offer surgery, okay? But what happens is as patients grow from their adolescence into their, into their late teens and even early 20s, we find that during their growth spurts, the curve, which is the mm -hmm. angle, it's yeah. called a Cobb angle, that can progress. And if it progresses greater than 30 degrees and then progresses further from there, we would tend to offer surgery. Also, if patients develop pulmonary issues mm -hmm. or, or any type of systemic sure, the, symptoms, the we would- The stuff you described a little bit ago. But mm -hmm. if you, so if you're a parent and you think your child has a little something going mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. I mean, what do you look for and how do you know when to seek treatment? I guess it's if it hurts, would that be it? Well, anytime you see an abnormality of the shoulder height and anytime you see an abnormality of the leg length, if there's a discrepancy of the leg length, if the clothes aren't fitting properly or if they're sitting improperly, mm -hmm. or when the, pa when the patient or child leans forward and you see the rib is not symmetric, they should seek consultation with a specialist because this, this is something that will ultimately need to be followed. Right, but the difference is when we were talking about the older mm -hmm. population, that's kind of a degenerative thing. But with Correct. these kids, it's really about they might have been born that way, that something wasn't formed Correct. quite normally. Correct, and so we see this occur in patients who have musculoskeletal disorders, cerebral palsy, and they can have congenital disorders where they actually have an an extra vertebrae that ultimately is causing the bending of the spine. Then what do you do in surgery? Do you get rid of that vertebrae? Correct. Yep, we get we would remove the vertebrae and stabilize the spine and make it straight again. Is that surgery, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, you're basically talking about back surgery. Correct. And back surgery, as we all know, sometimes doesn't have the greatest results. I mean, people, Correct. Te that tends to be like the, the, the last thing you want to do, right? Correct. Surgery is always the last option for patients. We always put patients through a conservative treatment regimen, which is included with physical therapy, exercise therapy. But if they progress through that and they develop further symptoms, then we offer surgery. Over the past five to 10 years, we've developed a lot more minimally invasive techniques to be able to treat spinal disorders and spinal mm -hmm. deformities, both in the pediatric and adolescent population as well as in the adult population. So meaning there's something in between the, the physical therapy and surgery? There is, but that's from a pain management standpoint, there are things that can yeah. be done. But from an actual surgical standpoint, when we talk about what, what do we have to do to correct this, there are minimally invasive surgical treatments that can mm. be done to actually fix and correct the spine without having to do either major open procedures or extensive spine surgery that had been done decades ago. Why not do it when a kid's first born? That's a great question. So we always want to look at the patient's skeletal age and we want to allow them to be able to grow. So if we have to stabilize and correct the spine, that could potentially limit the growth oh. of the spinal oh. column. So you mean they might not be as tall as they should Correct. be or they might, Correct. Some, the one leg might be, I, there could be all kinds of issues if you don't let that. Correct, and so a lot of times patients who can have a minor scoliosis at a young age will not require surgery probably 90% of patients that we see who have a mild scoliosis with conservative treatments don't need surgery. Really? They, and is yeah. it almost like they, I don't want to say grow out of it, but they get to they a can. point where they can they grow can. out of it? They, they can. The curve can stabilize and it can be of, of a few degrees, which ultimately will not lead to any true clinical issues for them. And you do all of this at at the medical centers at St. Catharines, et cetera, and um, correct. So I mean, it's the, the, the there's a place close by to come and get the help you need. Well, the, the the beautiful thing about it is now we have a multidisciplinary team that can help take care of patients in the community, and the goal has been to be able to provide this care without patients having to leave the community and go seek treatment elsewhere. So we have the whole gamut of treatment from conservative treatment, physical therapy, bracing, and then 
to the actual surgery if it's required. And mm -hmm. so we can, we can accomplish all these things here in the community for the patients. And if somebody needs bracing, that's mm -hmm. kind of a step in between surgery and physical therapy, right? Correct, and usually bracing is done in conjunction with physical therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, usually if the patients are found to have a significant enough curve, they'll undergo bracing. And then at the same time as bracing, they will do yeah. concomitant physical therapy. Okay, well, we're going to talk about the physical therapy aspects of all this in just a minute, so stay put. We're going to come back to you in a bit, um, but we're going to take a quick break and continue our discussion after this with more information about identifying and treating scoliosis. We'll be right back. <music> Welcome back to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. Joining us now is Laurel Pettit, a St. Charles Hospital physical therapist who is certified in the SROTH method for scoliosis. Thank you so much for being here and welcome. We're going to talk about all of that in just a minute. But first, you. we keep talking about these cob angles and all these sorts of things with the spine, which I think is hard for people to kind of understand. Can you... I know you've brought your friend here with yes. you. Can you kind of describe it for us and show us what we mean by all of that, sure. Laurel? So this is a spine. Mm -hmm. This would be a straight spine. Mm -hmm. So the Cobb angle basic, basically measures the degree of the upper end vertebrae, lower end of the curve. Mm -hmm. So it would look this way if this was a right thoracic curve. Along with the curvature is rotation of the vertebrae as well, which would look that way. Whoa. I and again, that varies depending right. on the degree. But so if we've got a really bad Cobb angle to the point where somebody needs surgery, how bad is that going to look? Uh, generally, surgery is going to be indicated with higher numbers, um, above 45 and getting up there. So that would really be, it's hard, this one doesn't bend that well, but... <laughs> yeah, but it's something like that. You're going to see a much greater curve. Okay. Yeah, and the rotation as well. Okay, so talk to me then about the therapies that you do because from what we heard earlier in the program, there are a lot of really good therapies that will mean surgery isn't necessary. Absolutely. So what I do is the Schroth method. Um, the Schroth method originated in Germany in the 1920s, then went to Barcelona, some modifications were made there, and then it made its way to the United States. So it's basically very specific to the individual um, depending on what their Cobb angle is, um, what they present with clinically, for example, ridge ca rib cage deformities, pelvic asymmetries, flat back you see a lot in scoliosis, um, differences in muscle mm -hmm. length. Um, and all of those could be things that somebody's born with, I mean, in the adolescence, or that develops as they, they start to grow. They probably are born with some Yes, but it doesn't show up usually until they hit their growth spurt, mm -hmm. generally between age 10 to 12. They'll usually get picked up at a pediatrician visit, a well visit. They may have them do a forward bend test and they may see asymmetries in the rib cage or the rib cage prominence. They're then sent to a specialist, x-rays are performed, and they're diagnosed mm -hmm. with scoliosis. And then they come to you. Then they come to me. And so what is this method? So it's a group of exercises, like I said, that are based on the person individually. Right, but what so, kind of exercises? What they're do you all do? different. They're all different. So some of them are done laying on the floor um, using various props. We do use some tractioning. Um, we use props such as bean bags. We use poles. Um, we also use a ladder 
-hmm. That's probably the most common prop that you would see. So, so that, what, do they hang from the ladder? Yep, we do oh. a lot of hanging mm -hmm, in order to stretch the spine, help derotate the spine, um, strengthen muscles, stretch muscles. And how often does somebody come in and do this kind of therapy? And when do they start it? I mean, if they're a kid, when do they start it? So it depends. Um, generally, their cob angle needs to be 15 degrees or greater um, before I would start doing shelf with them. I've treated people from age five, um, age 12, 13, 14, 15, and even adults. So it really varies, and that's why it's very tailored to the individual. Mm -hmm. I may do some exercises with a five-year-old that I wouldn't do with a 70 or 80 year old or a 12 year old. So mm -hmm. again, tailored to the individual. Right, and then when you do these things, like particularly with the ladder, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. that kind of thing people can't ordinarily do at home, but there are things that they can then keep up at home. Uh, what, how often do they do them? When do yeah. they, when are they with you? When can they be at home, et cetera? So, so generally I'm, when I first see a patient, I try to see them twice a week for the first six weeks. Then we cut down to one time for another eight weeks. We try to get to a total of 20 visits. By the time a person reaches 20 visits, they should have everything set up at home. And I do this with them from day one. We start talking about what does your home look like? How can we set things up at home so that it's gonna make it easy for you to come home, do your exercises, and be done with it. Right. Um, so there's lots of different ways. Some people actually do get a ladder and have it installed in either their basement, um, sometimes in the child's room, or there's other things you can do, such as a doorway chin-up bar. Um, there are chin-up bars that go in between the door frames as well. Sure. So there are various things that we can set up at home. And like I said, I spent a lot of time planning with families how to best accomplish this. Well, so I'm assuming that this is probably far more successful with children or young adults, adolescents, than it is with older people, because older people, it's more degenerative. It right? depends. The goals are going to be a little different. So generally with an adult who's more degenerative, um, they usually have pain symptoms. Uh, so my goals may vary. Um, it's going to be really to reduce their pain, improve their flexibility, strength, range of motion. I'm doing all of those things with younger children as well. However, younger children generally don't have pain mm -hmm. um, and they're able to get into various positions. So an adult that might be unsteady on their feet, I'm not going to have them lying on the floor or doing a lot of transfers. We may be doing things in the seated position. They may just be reaching up to the ladder for a gentle stretch to elongate the spine as best they can. Versus a child, they're probably hanging from the bars. They're doing a lot of other exercises as well. We also use physio balls, right. therabands. All sorts of things. What about things like yoga and Pilates? Do they work? Are they helpful? Yes. Do you recommend them for I people? I do. So, and parents often have that question. Um, what I do tell them is, if, especially with yoga positions, if their child is going to be participating in yoga, I want to see the poses that they're doing and review it with them because there are a lot of positions that are contraindicated for scoliosis. Like? Um, for example, you want to avoid any extreme forward flexion, um, any extreme extension or a back bending, rotation. Not that you can't do those positions, but for, like you said, a, a yoga position, you're in that position and you're holding it. Mm -hmm. So I want to see the patient in that position. I want to make sure their pelvis is symmetrical, their back is symmetrical, they're in the correct posture, then they can perform that exercise. Yeah, well, it sounds like, I mean, actually this therapy sounds like something we all could use. It is. <laughs> um, and then there's some, some breathing parts of yes. it. Yes. So generally, again, the rib cage deformity comes along with the rotation that I explained before. So you may have one side that's flattened. Um, those muscles become short and tight. So we direct the breathing towards opening that area up and expanding, stretching those muscles mm -hmm. um, and strengthening at the same time. So there is breathing involved in every exercise that we do. And what about older people who, um, you know, we were t I, was, I was talking before about the, uh, what's it called, kyphoscoliosis? Kyphoscoliosis. That, mm -hmm. that sort of thing that comes as part of the aging process. Can this stuff work yes. for that? We actually do use shroth for kyphosis as well. So the exercises are a little different, but similar concepts. Breathing is also involved. And it sounds like, um, again, it's all very customized for people. Very customized. But at the end of the day, what you really want to do is get people so they're as pain-free as possible and so that... Pain-free, improved postural awareness, improved strength, range of motion. Yeah. 
It's making me feel right now like I need, really need to sit up straight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about my posture. I really am with things like this. So we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to bring both you and the doctor back and kind of wrap up this conversation. So stay right here because there's more of CHS Presents Lifestyles of the Heart of Health right after this break. Welcome back to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. We're discussing how to identify and treat scoliosis. And back with us again is Dr. Salvatore Zavarella, an attending neurosurgeon from Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center, St. Catherine of Siena Medical Center, and St. Joseph Hospital, and Laurel Pettit, a St. Charles Hospital physical therapist. So we've been talking a lot about, about scoliosis, but the thing that strikes me is with older people, is are there things that we can do to prevent it? And I'm thinking in particular about how we get hunched over our computers and, and that sort of thing. Is that a problem? It is. It, it does play a major role in patients' deterioration of their symptoms. Patients can ultimately correct these by maintaining good posture, maintaining good core strength, stretching. We, we really advocate a lot of stretching of their legs, of their hip flexors, and then limit any major heavy lifting whereby you're not lifting properly, where, you, where you're bending forward and using your back rather than using your your legs and your, in, in your knees. I mean, there are people who are in professions where they have to do a lot of lifting, so they need to what? Can they Sometimes you see people with these braces around their, their, their waist or abdomens. Is that helpful? Patients, people in the construction field, we do advocate utilizing some of these braces because it can definitely help limit the, the use of their back because they're constantly lifting. And a lot of times they're doing things subconsciously that ultimately could potentially hurt them down the road. Do you think you're seeing more of this degeneration uh, in older adults because of this whole computer thing? I mean, is that a problem? I think it is, and I, and I think it's become more of a problem over time. Uh, people are spending a lot more time on, on the computer, on a cell phone, or on a tablet, and they're, they're not cognizant of their posture, and that ultimately can contribute to the degenerative process. And so we do discuss with patients standing while they're working, getting mm -hmm. a stand-up desk, which is good, limit the amount of sitting. Sitting is, is, a, is a big problem for sure. your spine health. Sure. Now, one of the interesting things about your therapy mm -hmm. is it's 3D. Mm -hmm. Like, explain that to me. Yeah. So we treat the patient three-dimensionally, meaning when you look at that curve, you're looking at it one-dimensionally. We are looking at it from all different dimensions. So we're looking at it from a side-to-side -side view, an all-around view. So we're looking at the rotation as well as the cob angle, which we talked about before. Mm -hmm. Which is unusual. That's not like any other kinds of therapies that are out no. there. So it's not just what you used to see a lot was if your curve is right, we're going to have you bend this way, the opposite way. We don't do that anymore because we realize that it's not just in one plane. It's in three planes mm -hmm. of motion. So. That makes that spine so interesting, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It really mm -hmm. is quite the... Quite, quite the, the skeleton is quite something. So if last words to our audience about things they might want to think about, either if their child has it or if they're an adult and are concerned about possibly getting it. Mm -hmm. any, any ideas? Um, I would just say that, you know, early detection is the key. Um, when you're looking at children, adolescents, 
If you think you see something, if you think you see an asymmetry in your child's shoulder heights or their pelvis, have them checked out and start therapy right away. The earlier you start, the better. Keeping active, um, limiting screen time, like the doctor talked about. Um, we see kids nowadays too on their phones constantly sitting like this. Yeah, scrunched you know, shoulders. Right, yeah. right. We want to encourage good posture and good habits from a young age. And you? Yeah, I, I, I would I would reiterate, uh, I would definitely reiterate that. I think, you know, surgery is always going to be the last option for patients. And so if we can maximize their conservative efforts, if we can diagnose and treat early, a lot of times we can avoid surgery, and that's the important thing from an adolescent with scoliosis, if we can get them into a good exercise program, all the way up to an adult who has a, a degenerative deformity of their spine. It's the same thought process, managing their symptoms conservatively, allowing them to strengthen their core and get, get good spine care and spine health, and potentially avoid surgery. And stand up straight. That's right. <laughs> thank you so much. We want to thank our guests, Dr. Zavarella and Lauren Pettit, for sharing so much important information about how to identify and treat scoliosis. As always, for more information or to schedule an appointment at one of Catholic Health Service's six outstanding hospitals, you can call 1-855-CHS-4500 or visit chsli.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jane Hansen, wishing you goodbye and good health.